Okay, welcome back. Um, so this time uh, I want to go back to what is officially the introduction to being in nothingness. It's a chapter called The Pursuit of Being. Uh, and I want to read uh, two sections there where Sartre uh, analyzes the, the idea that consciousness is consciousness of something. Um, and so we already, we've already started to do that in that material we looked at from the first chapter from around page 74, we talked about what the immediate form experience takes is like uh, in concrete situations. Here, he's going to just be one step more abstract and talk in general about the very character of um, consciousness and the, uh, and, this, and the very structure of consciousness of. Uh, so I want to start um, uh, by reading something from page 11. Um, he says, uh, this is line 5, uh, Sartre says, all consciousness, as Husserl has shown, is consciousness of something. This means that there is no consciousness that is not the positing of a transcendent object, or if you prefer, that consciousness has no content. So there is no consciousness that is not a positing of a transcendent object. Positing means essentially explicitly recognizing. So you're, the consciousness to be conscious is to be conscious of something, to be aware of something to explicitly notice something. Uh, so that, uh, and, and that thing that you notice is something else. You, you notice some other. Um, and he says, uh, so some other to consciousness. And so he says, uh, or if you prefer consciousness has no content, right? So the point he's trying to get at there is there isn't some special thing you find that is you as a consciousness that sort of floats around blankly for a while. And then periodically, you get some content in it, like you go out and uh, look at something or whatever. But you know, you could always retreat back to just this consciousness by itself, right? That that never happens. To be consciousness, to be conscious, is always to be engaged with something. There's there is always something that your reality of being a conscious being is about. Um, and so he says uh, uh, something. Um, more about that that I think helps to make that point even clearer. He says, uh, about 15 more lines down, he says, um, all consciousness uh, is positional in that it transcends itself in order to reach an object and it exhausts itself in this same positing, right? So the very nature of consciousness is that it is an awareness of something else, something it, it encounters as not it, and, it, and he says it exhausts itself there, right? There's If you pay attention to the experience you're having right now, you know, you're aware of something, and there isn't anything else. There isn't some other thing that is you apart from this happening of an experience. And, uh, and th this experience is a very determinate, very specific experience of something, and th there is no hiding from that. There's no retreat from that, right? That is your experience. It is this this saturated kind of reality. Um, and uh, so he says, uh, all that there is of intention in my actual consciousness is directed toward the outside, toward the table or whatever, right? They aim at something, right? So um, uh, the, your your consciousness is, is always this, this full happening of something appearing. So um, I want to look at a at a picture here. Uh, so this this image is uh, it's by Alex Colville and it's called Family in Rainstorm from 1955. Um, that looks to me like Cape Blomidon in the background. Um, I used to live uh, uh, very close to where I think this is in uh, Nova Scotia. Anyway, um, you know what is this picture of? Well, it's a picture of. Um, uh, looked like a little girl getting into a car and a somewhat older brother standing behind her, presumably, and the mom holding the car door open. The car is parked on a little uh, meadowy kind of thing near a beach by uh, the ocean, actually by the tidal basin of the Bay of Fundy, if I'm not mistaken, um, looking across at this uh, natural thing, Cape Blomidon, I think, and it looks like it's starting to rain over there and so on. You know, it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I, I like this painting in part because uh, 
you know, it's it's moderately realistic. I think people would probably call it sort of hyper-realistic or something, so it's got that sort of fantastic air about it, but it's basically a kind of realistic thing. Um, and you can say, you know, what it is. Um, so the thing that I want you to notice about it is that, of course, it is a picture of mom and two kids in a car and so on, but, but it really does give you the sense of uh, what the person, it's almost like a photograph, and you get a picture of what the person taking the photograph would be seeing. In other words, yes, it is a picture of some people and a car and a natural setting, but it also seems like a picture of a perspective, and it's the perspective of, you know, someone who is there with them looking on at them. Uh, and that's the thing that I think is interesting, because this picture then, uh, in addition to being a portrait of something real, is also a portrait of what it's like to have an experience of something. This is a portrait of what it's like to be you at any moment, right? At any moment, you, yeah, I mean, you're not seeing your wife and children getting into your car in, in Nova Scotia, but you're seeing something, something like this, right? And if we ask, you know, let's imagine this is a portrait of uh, Alex Colville's own uh, perspective on his family. I have no idea if it is or not, and I don't care, but let's pretend it is. Um, uh, uh, th that's, that's a picture of, of what his reality as a conscious being is like at that moment, right? That's, that's uh, how he exists. He exists as the seeing of this. And, you know, the, the picture, because it's a painting, can really only give you sort of the visual domain, right? Um, so, uh, you know, there are other things that would be going on with him that aren't exactly conveyed here, although they might be implied, you know, like he, he would be seeing this, but like the guy, the, the merchant who's fleeing from Jesus in that Luca Giordano painting I looked at last time, uh, here, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of feeling involved. Like the, that merchant probably was feeling anger and maybe some fear with respect to Jesus. Here, you know, this guy might be feeling love or who knows, maybe he's feeling alienation and estrangement. It's kind of a weird picture. So maybe this is a picture of a guy who's, uh, I don't know, maybe he's about to murder his family or something. I don't know. But anyway, like like the uh, like the like that merchant in the Luca Giordano painting who's... Uh, experiencing anger, let's say, or fear as, as Jesus is coming down at him with a stick, the, the, the person having this experience here would also be having this visual experience in, a, in an emotionally charged way. And that person would be hearing things too, right? So there'd be a lot of other stuff going on as well. So, so in that sense, uh, this painting, because it's painting, is kind of restricted uh, to showing consciousness in its visual dimension. But then nonetheless, it is, it is fundamentally a portrayal of consciousness. And, and what it really shows you is that the way you exist is being exhausted in the object that transcends you, right? You exist as an awareness of something. And that, uh, that thing you're aware of is something other than you, something that, that uh, is, you know, kind of real thing in the world or whatever. Um, and there isn't something to you other than that rich fullness of your experience of that stuff. There isn't some other part of you or some place where you are happening, right? Um, so, so I'd like you to look at this picture at, at, you know, such that you notice it is simultaneously a, portray a portrayal of the real and a portrayal of someone's experience. And so insofar as it's a picture of someone's experience, it's a picture of someone who is aware of this, right? That's what it means to be conscious of it. But now Sartre makes a kind of important point on page 11. So he's just been saying that all consciousness is positional in that it is of an object. So there's a way in which you're, you're knowing. Uh, but he says then, this is about a dozen lines up from the bottom of the page. He says, however, the necessary and sufficient condition for a knowing consciousness to be knowledge of its object is that it be consciousness of itself as being that knowledge. The point he's trying to make is a good one, right? The, the, the very idea of being aware of something is that intrinsic to that is this, this idea that you're, you're aware that you're aware. Like that, that's what it means to be aware. Uh, but the, the point he wants to make here is um, in saying that you have to be aware of your awareness, that's not the same as saying that 
you have knowledge of yourself as a knowing thing, the same way that you have knowledge of the object you're being aware of. He says, on the contrary, um, and this is now page 12, about 10 lines up from the bottom, he says, there must be an immediate non-cognitive relation of the self to itself. Um, and then he says, uh, um, on page 13, line 2, in other words, every positional consciousness of an object is at the same time a non-positional consciousness of itself. Right? So again, if you look at this, this picture, you know, if you, if, you, if you imagine yourself in that situation, you, you, know, you, you know, you'd be seeing these things and feeling various things, and you'd be aware that that's happening to you. So on the one hand, consciousness exhausts itself in its experience of something. But in that experience of something, in that explicit experience of something, there is implicit, running through the whole of that experience, an awareness of yourself uh, as one who is conscious. And so Sartre calls that then a pre-reflective cogito. He says uh, now on page 13, this is about 15 lines up from the bottom, um, there is a pre-reflective cogito that is the condition of the Cartesian cogito. In, in other words, uh, we're, we're very familiar with thinking of ourselves as an I, you know, and we, we're, we're used to talking about Descartes' meditations where he says, I'm aware of myself as a thinking thing. You know, we're used to thinking about that idea that I can reflect on myself and notice myself, and we're used to thinking of that as kind of what defines our consciousness. So we're going to call that the Cartesian cogito, right? The explicit uh, noticing about yourself that, that you are a thinking thing. And so, yes, we can do that. But he's saying, Sartre's trying to say here that, that um, you can do that only because it is integral to your experience at all times that there's a kind of tacit awareness of yourself, uh, which is what you sort of draw on then to explicitly rec reflect on yourself and find yourself there. Uh, uh, or said the other way around, the awareness of yourself that you carry with you in your everyday experience is not of the form of that Cartesian cogito. Uh, it's it's of this form of, as he says, this non-positional um, awareness of self. Uh, so this is uh, one of the first uh, sort of technical notions you're going to get from Sartre. It's, it's a pr particularly important one. It runs throughout the whole book. And it's the notion of the, the pre-reflective cogito. That's one way he describes it. Um, or on the next page, uh, page 14, he says, uh, you know, we're going to call this a non-positional consciousness of self, but that's sort of awkward. So he says, from now on, I'm going to call this uh, the conscience de soi. And he's going to put the de of in parentheses. So he's going to say, yeah, you have this kind of consciousness of yourself, but that's not consciousness of in the same way that consciousness of the situation is consciousness of. On the contrary, in positing, being explicitly aware of, you know, the room that you're in with the piano and whatever else, you're non-positingly aware of yourself as the one having that experience, right? You're tacitly aware of yourself as the one noticing. So, so he says, you're conscious of yourself, but you've got to recognize that that's a different kind of of, so he's going to put that in brackets. Well, Hazel Barnes has decided that she's going to translate in a way that never lets you see that, which is a little bit unhelpful. Uh, but we will certainly remember that, right? That there is a pre-reflective cogito or a pre-reflective conscience de soi, consciousness of self, with the of in parentheses, meaning meaning it's not an explicit positing of the self. It's not a, as he would else, uh, elsewhere say, a thetic consciousness, right? This, your self is not taken as the theme or the thesis of your consciousness. So it's not a thetic consciousness. Um, and so... Now, uh, going back, let's look at the picture just one more time. Uh, so going back to this again, uh, he, he comes to a conclusion. So, so he's said a few things there, all of which are pretty important. He's described the way that consciousness is exhausted in its experience of something that transcends it. And he's described the way that there is always implicit in such an experience an awareness of oneself as having that experience, and that's the pre-reflective conscience de soi. And now he says... Uh, on uh, the next paragraph on page 14, so this is, I guess, line 10, he says, This self-consciousness, the conscience de soi with the de in parenthesis, we ought to consider not as a new consciousness, but 
as the only mode of existence which is possible for a consciousness of something. So in other words, and this, this now, I keep looking at this picture because I'm hoping in looking at this picture you're seeing a kind of um, um, portrait, compelling portrait of what it's like to be you at every second, including right now. Um, you know, he says to exist as this, to, to, to be the kind of thing that has this experience, right? To be that kind of thing, the kind of thing that we are, right? Is to be the kind of thing that's characterized by this pre-reflective conscience de soi and so on. And he's saying like that, I'm going to repeat some words I just said, that's what we are. That's, that's what you are. That's the kind of existence you have. You are an activity of experiencing. That's all you've ever been. Right? So you have various theories about yourself that you've come up with by, by taking, you know, uh, whatever, zoology class or something or anthropology class. I don't know what. Uh, but you have ideas about yourself as a certain kind of animal in the natural world. And you probably think about matter and energy and brains and circulatory systems and, I don't know, gravity, whatever else. All, all that sort of stuff that you think about to try to come up with an account of yourself right but those things are all secondary those are all efforts you and other people have made to try to explain something what is it that you're trying to explain well you're trying to explain the uh the basic fact of your occurrence and you are occurring right now and you occur as this activity of experiencing and you've never occurred as anything else Right? And so it's important to remember that all those things, you know, zoological, anthropological, physical, whatever else things you think about, those are all um, interpretations of this original fact or theories about this original fact. Right? So they might or might not be right. They might be right, but they might not be. And, you know, whether they're right or not doesn't change the fact that you are and always and only have been this act of experiencing. And so let me read that sentence again. He says, this uh, conscience de soi we ought to consider as the only mode of existence that's possible for a consciousness of something. And this is how we are. This is how we exist. And so, um, you know, remember the subtitle of the book, right? A phenomenological essay on ontology. Um, so I would talk a little bit last time about what it meant for it to be phenomenology. Uh, my point here now is this is why he's talking about ontology. <coughs> he's talking about what kind of reality that thing we commonly call a human being is. What kind of reality you are. What kind of reality I am. I say that kind of thing we call a human being because you should recognize that that language of a human being is already one of those modes of interpretation. It's got a lot of uh, theoretical baggage attached to it. It's built in, it, it comes from various kinds of discourses and ways of analyzing things. So you're already thinking of it as basically, you know, a zoological species and so on. Um, but so yeah, maybe you're a human being, maybe that's right. Uh, but primarily what you are, what you indubitably are, is this act of experiencing. And, and that's the way he's describing it, uh, the conscience de soi and so on. That, that issue of ontology is important because we're going to go on to talk about being a little bit later. Um, but uh, so he's going to, uh, so I'm going to go on and read one more thing now about consciousness of, but I want to say one more thing while still looking at this picture. Um, and so Sartre says, you know, what is this kind of being? What is this kind of existence we're talking about that we have? He says, well, we're, we're going to say that the kind of thing you are is a being for self, right? That's the kind of reality you have, being for self. And what that means is uh, you're a being for whom something is happening, right? So if, if on the one hand, you're always conscious of something, well, that's, all, that's the same as saying something is always happening for you. So you are the kind of being for whom there is always uh, your family in a rainstorm, or, or in my case, you know, a, a, a room with a piano and a lamp and whatever else in it, you know. Um, you exist as the one for whom something is always appearing. Right? And so you might think of this Coville picture when you try to read those 
paragraphs there and to think about what he's writing there on pages 11 to 14 as a, a, a kind of um, description of uh, the of, of being for self description of the kind of existence that you have uh, as uh, as an experiencing being right uh, okay so let's now uh, let's move on from there to uh, one more passage uh, so now let's go to page 23 so here again he's going to st start off page 23 um, about uh, 15 lines down or something like this again he says consciousness is consciousness of something so let's think about that so so in the last one he was saying consciousness is consciousness of something and he was taking that up from the consciousness of side right he was he was saying what's it like to be that thing such that you're aware now he's going to take it up from the of something side right so consciousness is consciousness of something this means that transcendence is the constitutive structure of consciousness uh, that is, consciousness is born, supported by a being that is not itself. Um, what does that mean? Well, let's look at one one uh, more picture here. Um, this is a, a picture by uh, uh, Kaspar David Friedrich. Uh, it's a ravine in the uh, Elba Sandstone Mountains. Um, the once again, you know, this is a picture that you can uh, you could say it's a realistic picture slightly hyper-realistic picture of a uh, natural setting, right? Uh, landscape and so on. You can see that's a pathway and some rocks and some more rocks in the distance and some clouds and so on, right? It goes off in space. There's light coming in from the sun, whatever else. There's shadow, right? It's, it's, a, it's a basically realistic picture of the natural world. But again, it's also clearly a picture of a perspective. Right? It's basically what you would see if you were walking down a path. Um, there's another, uh, you know, fairly famous picture by uh, the same fellow, uh, wanderer above a sea of fog, um, and so you know, here you see a guy looking out, and that last picture is a little bit more like what a guy like that would see. Um, so let's just stick with the picture of what he would see. Um, uh, but the so the point here is. Um, we, we were saying consciousness is consciousness of something, but what, what is it that you are conscious of? Well, uh, one thing that you can do, is, I'm just going to do digress for a second. One thing that you can do while you're sitting around is you can imagine, you know, what it would be like if you were 10 feet tall or if you went to the beach or if it were last summer or whatever, right? You, you have these imaginations. Um, notice that your immediate experience is not like that, right? In your imagination, you can turn things on or off, you can change their color, their shape, um, how many there are. Uh, and in your imagination, there's only as much there as you have made up, right? So if I say, like, imagine you're, if I say, uh, imagine you are, you're at the beach right now. If I ask you the question, you know, how many people are there beside you? Or if I say, what temperature is it? Or if I say, you know, what color is the sand? Or if I say, are there any trees, right? There might not be an answer to any of those questions. Whether there is an answer or not depends on whether you happen to include that in your imagining. But 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 that's very different from what your uh, immediate experience is actually like. Your immediate experience is of a world that transcends you, right? That it's not a world that answers to your imagination. It's a world that confronts you with... Uh, something you have to answer to whether you like it or not and, and it's kind of opaque to you right in short in your experience you're confronted with something that you experience as real and it it uh it is there on its own terms not on terms that you made up and all those details are specified whether you thought of them or not right uh it, are there other people on the beach how hot is it is there a tree there uh what time of day is it what season is it right the 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 object of your experience is uh, fully determined in all those respects uh, in a way that your imagination is not. Your imagination is only as determined as you happen to get around to making it. Right? But the object of your experience in your everyday life is, is given to you as something, to use his language, literally that transcends you, that goes beyond your experience of it. Right? And so that's why I like this picture of the, the natural setting, the rocky ravine. 
because it basically it's so in your everyday experience the world is given to you as nature as this thing outside you that really doesn't care about you at all right so um that's so he says this means uh transcendence is the constitutive structure of consciousness that is consciousness is born supported by a being that is not itself right all consciousness is consciousness of so there was never an experiencing that wasn't the experiencing of something that exceeded it now that's not a theory about what reality is like that's a description of the the form in which the fact of your experience always happens right? um, so the 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 being this this um, the fact of being transcended by a real is as much a constitutive and inescapable structure of your experience as is being a pre-reflective conscience de soi. So Sartre then says a little bit later on, uh, to say that consciousness is consciousness of something means that for consciousness there is no being outside of that precise obligation to be a revealing intuition of something, namely of a transcendent being, right? That's the flip side of saying it's, you're exhausted in the object and that consciousness has no content of its own. Consciousness just is, as he says, the obligation. Like, it's not the sense an obligation that you might or not perform. It's not an obligation someone sets to you. It's the, it's the obligation in the sense of the living structure of your reality is to be, as he says, a revealing intuition of something of a transcendent being and in fact let me let me uh, stress or let me uh, say something about each of those words revealing intuition intuition meaning uh, we're not talking about a judgment or a thought we're talking about the immediate form in which experience happens right so you are the the form in which your experience happens is that you are immediately and directly confronted by something that is experienced by you as not you as transcending you and so your experience is a revealing intuition in that, again, the very character of your uh, experience is that it is discovering something about it. It is bringing something to uh, explicitude about that thing. And in that sense, it's a revelation. So, so as he says then, again, at the, right at the bottom of the page, 23, he says, consciousness implies in its being a non-conscious and trans-phenomenal being. Now, let me just say one more word about that, about the trans-phenomenal. Um, so, so yes, you you uh, you see something, and you could say, "Oh, this is my experience right now. I'm I'm having this experience." And then you see something else, and you say, "I'm having this experience again." And somebody might say, "Well, aren't those just uh, phenomena of you? Aren't those just reflections of of you?" And his point is that no, the very the very way your experiences uh, happens is that the object is given as transcending you as and and therefore the object is given in experience as something that is not reducible to the experiences you have of it so the very form our experience takes you, you might say is that it brings with it a kind of distinction between reality and appearance right in other words uh your your experience is the, your, the object is given in your experience as something upon which you are taking a perspective but which is not itself defined by your perspective on it um, and he actually if you go back on page 22 he said something like that um, about uh, eight lines up uh, he says um, it is that which escapes that which by definition will never be given that which offers itself only in fleeting and successive profiles i mean basically the the real which is uh you, you ex your experience takes the form of you experiencing something as real or as transcending you to experience it as transcending you is to experience it as something that you are only seeing you know from an angle or from a side or whatever but it is experienced as um uh that which is not reducible to the successive profiles or appearances that you get on it right and that's why he calls it trans phenomenal it goes uh beyond the phenomena it goes beyond uh, the experiences you have on it so he says this at the, at the end then uh, uh, so ultimately what does that mean he says well to say that consciousness is consciousness of something uh, is to say that uh, it must produce itself as a 
revealed revelation of a being which it is not and which gives itself as already existing when consciousness reveals it. So I wanted to go to this um, ravine with this picture of nature just to remind you again of that. That, um, uh, And again, I hope this picture is something you can sort of experience again as a reasonable portrait of what it's like for you to exist at every second of your existence. Right? You experience yourself as in reality where you you experience yourself as in a world that exists independently of your experience of it in your experience the the object is given or gives itself as already existing uh independently of the the revealing of it that is happening in your consciousness so those are the two the two points i wanted to bring out uh from this uh, introductory section on the pr pursuit of being um, and I, I want to make one now concluding point, but uh, but notice, as I said, uh, we're we're doing the same thing that we were doing last time when we were beginning with that remark about uh, the immediate form of conscious consciousness as the consciousness of a situation of existency, and, uh, sorry, ex exigency, uh, and the idea that it's a non-reflective practical consciousness and so on. Um, we're doing the same kind of thing we were doing there. We're just describing uh, the form in which our experience always happens. And here he's saying the form in which all our experience always happens is as an implicit awareness of yourself as experiencing something that uh, uh, exceeds your experience of it. And now going back to this thing about a phenomenological essay on ontology, um, there notice then that there are in fact two kinds of being two senses of what it is to be that in a way have been brought out just by the description of the form in which our existence always happens, right? On the one hand, there is the kind of being that you are, the kind of being that I am. Namely, I exist as the one for whom appearing happens, right? I exist as a being for self. But to be a being for self is to find yourself as the revealing intuition of something that is given as as transcending you right uh, the real basically well that uh, is something that is experienced as existing on its own independently of our perspectives on it and so on as you know i've been using the word real like it's, it's what we normally think of as reality well sartre says okay so how do we think of that well uh, and he's got a whole section on this uh, that we're not going to bother reading but he says you know, when we're talking about the kind of reality that we impute to the ob object of our experience right the kind of reality that is the intrinsic meaning of how the object of our experience is given in our experience we call that being in itself um, and so in our in our experience we experience ourselves as experiencing something that is real on its own and not defined by our experience of it. Okay. And so we, we, we experience something that we call the real. And you can look at the last, you know, 2,500 years of philosophical writers trying to define and describe what the real is like. And, the, and he's summing that up in the expression being in itself. Like it, and he says, you know, it is, it just is. And he sort of, um, more or less quotes, uh, Parmenides there almost when he, when he talks about it, it that is, and you can't say anything more about it. Um, so our experience is then, uh, it, remember, a phenomenological essay on ontology, our experience is kind of an uh, awkward confrontation of two different senses of what it is to be. Our experience is kind of a confrontation of the kind of reality that is experience itself and he's later going to go on to say um, that he's calling that being for itself. And he's later going to go on to say being for itself is uh, that which is not what it is and is what it is not. Uh, and we probably will talk about that and I'll probably explain it. But uh, whether or not I do doesn't matter. The, the point is just he, he's going to describe it in those words. And you can see that's very different from that of which we have experience which we experience as something that just is what it is. 
Right? So experience is then the, the confrontation of uh, a being that is what it is not and is not what it is with that which is what it is. Um, he's, he's trying to show you that those... He, so he's calling that ontology. He's talking about two different kinds of being. But he's trying to show you that those are uh, meanings intrinsic to the very fact of the happening of consciousness. Uh, the consciousness to exist is has to be that kind of thing as being for itself. But being for self is precisely defined as the experience of being in itself. Um, uh, and then the important point to notice is the difference between them, right? That the language and terms in which you would define being in itself, reality, if you just think of the language I was just using, are directly at odds with the kind of language and terms you'd need to describe what it is to be an existing being, namely that f being for self, to, for whom there is appearing, and so on. And um, the reason that I'm bringing that out, and the reason it's important for that to come up here, is one of the things Sartre is going to uh, try to emphasize in a way throughout the book is that we consistently make quite profound mistakes in our lives because we use concepts and categories that are appropriate for being in itself, that are appropriate for the reality of which we find ourselves having experience. We use those concepts and categories to try to interpret and explain our own existence. And so we, in a way, misconstrue and misinterpret being for itself as being in itself. Um, so uh, that's that I don't think I don't when I anticipate what I'm going to say, uh, I don't expect that I'm going to thematize or, you know, explicitly focus on that issue too much. But I mentioned I might. Uh, but I mention it here because that's really the, the way he kind of wants to launch this by saying uh, the thing we do wrong is that we um, mistake our own way of existing, the, the kind of thing that we are, namely being for itself. We mistake that for being in itself. Um, or in other words, we use the categories that are appropriate for the object of our experience to try to make sense of ourselves as subjects. And in that sense, we really get things wrong. Um, so uh, that issue I'll leave for the moment, but it's going to come back again right away next week, uh, next time when we talk about anxiety and freedom and so on. Um, but I'll just, I'll just give you those terms now because I really just want to get you through the introduction. Uh, and so I really want you to just get those points that all consciousness is consciousness of, and that means consciousness uh, just is exhausted in the experience of a transcending object. But even though it exhausts itself thereby, it is also characterized by an implicit awareness of itself, which he calls the pre-reflective cogito, or the pre-reflective conscience de soi, consciousness of self, in parentheses. Uh, and that kind of existence, of, of subjectivity, you might say, is being for itself. Uh, but that consciousness of an object is a consciousness of that which is given as not defined by our consciousness of it, given as transcending us it's, so our consciousness it takes the form of being consciousness of that which is given as being in itself uh, and being in itself is that which just is what it is and then the point I was making the categories appropriate to that are not appropriate to being for itself the categories of the object are not appropriate for understanding the reality of being a subject um, I'll leave it there for now, uh, but I hope that uh, that, coupled with the earlier stuff from pages 74 and so on, uh, is enough to give you a start at uh, Sartre's project of describing what it, what our experience is and what it's like, how it unfolds. Uh, and we'll take it up from there. We're going to go back uh, into chapter one again, that chapter called The Origin of Negation, and, and look at a few different things there.